A small town in Nevada faces disaster. A holiday weekend, a quarter million tourists, and a thousand pound bomb that could explode at any second. The device cannot be disarmed. It cannot be moved without detonating. Here we have the all clear. Stand by for For the FBI, it's a worst case scenario. In 1980, the FBI faced the largest explosive device they had ever seen. The bomb was sophisticated, carefully constructed, and designed to destroy an entire building. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Agents and bomb experts responded from all over the country. Their mission, to disarm the deadly device and stop the dangerous extortionists who built it. Stateline Nevada is a small tourist town straddling the border with California. The town has just 1,300 residents. The largest industry is gambling. With all that cash lying around, it makes an appealing target for criminals looking to make a big score. August 26, 1980, 5.30 a.m. at the receiving entrance of Harvey's Casino. Two men tell security they're delivering a new copy machine. The security guard gives them directions to the executive offices on the second floor. He has no idea what he has let in the building. This is no copier. Shortly after 6 a.m., a security guard making rounds notices something unusual. The door to the executive office is jammed. It looks like the lock has been glued shut. He manages to get the door open. The guard notices a bizarre-looking metal box in the middle of the room. On the floor, he finds a letter. According to the letter, the metal box contains a massive bomb. The guard contacts the Douglas County Sheriff's Department. Captain Ron Perini. It was about 6.30 in the morning. And I received a, a call from one of my sergeants who told me that they had found a device at Harvey's Casino. Perini calls in the Tahoe Douglas bomb squad. The device is huge and made of metal. According to the letter, it contains a thousand pounds of TNT. That much TNT could blow up everything within 500 feet of the casino. The letter also says the bomb has three separate timers, each set for different explosion times. The device cannot be moved. It cannot be disarmed. Unless authorities come up with $3 million in cash, the bomber threatens to blow up Harvey's casino. He also threatens that if the FBI thwarts this plan, then the bomber will strike the same hotel again. Yeah, this thing was big, and if it was real, and it did go off at that time, none of us would be alive. The complexity of the design and amount of TNT tells law enforcement this bomber means business. This device could blow up the entire block, and the police don't even know when it is set to go off. 
the bomber is holding all the cards. There was no indication from the bomb squad members that this was a false bomb, that it was just a shell. They felt it was very real. So there was a lot of issues going on at one time. How are we going to secure this? How are we going to provide the safety for everyone? The casino is packed with gamblers. The hotel is full of guests. With a bomb that size, police have to get the hundreds of innocent people to safety. Over the next several hours, 600 hotel guests are moved to a nearby high school. And it's scary, to tell you the truth. It's very scary. If this bomb would have gone off in that casino, we would have lost 600 people. As the guests are being evacuated, Captain Perini assesses the situation and determines he needs help. We're a relatively small department. We certainly don't have the expertise as some agencies may have in dealing with extortions and the resources and the money and all the things that go with that to do a proper investigation. So because it was an extortion, we called the FBI immediately. Special Agent Bill Junkie. We typically have extortion attempts at the casino, the state line. We've had those before. We've had plenty of small bombs placed here and there in various casinos. At this time, the FBI was receiving nearly 100 extortion threats a year against casinos, but they were seldom this serious. But I never, in my wildest dreams, envisioned a bomb of this size and this complexity. There are 28 toggle switches on the top box. Each one is numbered. They were all in the same position, in a downward position, except for one toggle switch, which was numbered 23. That was in the up position. We didn't know when we looked at those toggle switches, of course, what they went to, what they were for. Any one of the switches could deactivate the bomb or detonate it. They gave me a letter, which turned out to be an extortion letter. that identified various components of that bomb. And reading that letter, I realized we had a big, big problem here. The letter indicated to us that there was a 1,000 pounds of TNT in this bomb. And judging from the size of the small of the large box, I think it was pretty consistent that a 1,000 pounds of TNT could fit into that larger box. A 1,000 pounds of TNT has a huge blast radius, enough to destroy more than one casino. That would devastate this small town. We blocked off the casino quarter area on, on US 50, made sure no vehicles could go through. Um, we told the other casinos to vacate the immediate area near Harvey's, and they did that. They even boarded up some of the windows to make sure that if there was an explosion, that it would cause the glass to break and hurt others. As the sheriff's department closes down the streets, the bomb squad works on the device. The crew does not wear their bulky bomb suits because nothing could protect them if a bomb this size detonated. First, they want to know exactly what's inside the metal casing. What kind of bomb is it? How big of an explosion is it going to be? Is it going to affect the businesses across the street? Or how far will it go? Is there chemicals involved? Is there even nuclear stuff? Herb Hawkins is the assistant special agent in charge of the FBI's Las Vegas field office. Well, the device was x-rayed in parts because no x-ray machine was that big. So uh, about a third of the device was x-rayed, then another third, then another third. In all, the bomb squad takes over 200 x-rays. They also photograph the device and dust for fingerprints. Getting paint samples is much riskier, but for the FBI, it could be an important clue to identifying the bomber. Ultimately, we may find a guy who's got that kind of paint in his garage. Investigators also find a small drop of blood on one corner of the device. It is collected as potential evidence. We may be uh, able to find a guy whose blood matches that which was taken off the bomb. That's a good investigative lead for us. The latent fingerprints, paint, and blood samples are sent to the FBI lab in Washington, DC. In the lab, technicians will analyze the evidence in the hopes it will lead them to the bomber. But for the agents on the scene, the first priority is to disarm this bomb. In the command post, 
Investigators study the x-rays of the device. The bottom three quarters of this lower box was very high density. The x-rays couldn't penetrate it. That told us, in essence, that it was explosive in there or some kind of material in there filling that bottom box. We could see wires from the top box going into that material in the bottom box. We presume those were wires from the detonators, from the blasting caps, into that explosive material. Scientists from NEST, the nuclear emergency search team, analyzed the bottom portion of the bomb to calculate the potential blast radius. They estimated that uh, we were looking at about a 1,500 to 2,500 foot blast area where damage could be somewhat significant. And of course, inside of 800 yards, uh, we're looking at more than severe damage. And of course, total destruction within 200 meter radius. We realized this guy knew what he was doing, that it was going to be an extremely difficult bomb to defeat, if it could be defeated at all. Agents are in an impossible position, but they must find a way to disarm this bomb, and fast, before anyone gets hurt. In State Line, Nevada, extortionists plant a massive bomb in a crowded casino. The bombers demand $3 million, or they will detonate the device. Within hours of the discovery of the bomb, investigators from all over the area arrive in State Line. Sheriffs from Douglas County, police from South Lake Tahoe, as well as El Dorado County, Special Agent Bill Junkie. They started just flooding in because they knew we would have a lot, a lot of work to do. We began bringing in FBI agents from surrounding districts almost immediately. As bomb experts work on the device, agents go after the extortionists. We needed every patron in that casino to be interviewed with the chance that maybe they had seen something, a vehicle being uh, involved in the delivery of this bomb, something. Authorities set up toll-free hotlines. Captain Ron Perini and the Douglas County Sheriff's Department work closely with the FBI. We want to know if there's any witnesses, if anybody saw these people bring the device into the casino. What about vehicles, descriptions? The FBI questions the security guard. He tells them about seeing two men delivering a copy machine around 5.30 a.m. They were driving a white van. We knew that we may have a white van involved in this. We knew by then exactly what time that bomb came through the casino. We knew we had two people pushing and pulling that device. Investigators try to locate all the white vans in the Lake Tahoe area. Law enforcement officers were stopping these vans and finding out who, who the operators were. While agents on the street search for possible suspects, technicians continue to analyze the device. But the news is not good. This bomb is formidable. On that first day after the diagnostic work, the x-rays, the interpretation of that extortion letter, we realized that we weren't going to move that bomb, that we, in fact, had a viable, functioning, live, explosive device. We didn't know what the explosive inside was. We also figured we had explosives in that top box that made any sort of render safe procedure extremely, extremely difficult. By late afternoon, we decided that uh, we were not going to penetrate this bomb with any equipment that we had or that was developed anywhere in the country. It appears the bomber has won. The FBI must take a new approach. They are going to have to cooperate. That evening, agents meet with Harvey Gross, the owner of Harvey's Casino. We thought we might have a very good opportunity to arrest, to identify the people involved in this, in this crime through the delivery of the money. So we wanted to comply with the instructions. The bomber wants $3 million delivered to a remote location via helicopter. In exchange, authorities will receive instructions on how to move the bomb and detonate it safely. We told them the problems we were having with this bomb, and we had a window there that was closing as far as getting uh, the money together 
or deciding what we were going to do. Agents feel that $3 million in cash is the fastest way to find him. The casino owner is skeptical. And he said to us, what are you going to try and do with this person? And we said, we are going to try and catch him. And he said, well, if you're going to do that, I'm not giving him $3 million. So he gave us $5,000, which we appropriately marked, and the rest was cut up paper. An FBI pilot will fly the helicopter. Since the bomber has forbidden any radio contact, the pilot will wear a wire. He must land at a designated spot at South Lake Tahoe Airport no later than 11 p.m. At 12.05, he will receive further instructions. He specified that no law enforcement be involved in this operation whatsoever. Well, that was pretty unrealistic. We, of course, had numerous uh, law enforcement people uh, stationed and concealed throughout that airport in an effort to identify anyone that could be seen near that airport that might be linked to this extortion attempt. The pilot lands at South Lake Tahoe Airport at exactly 11 o'clock. In a nearby building, a team of FBI agents and police monitor the pilot's wire. We were waiting for contact from the bomber. And at 12.05, just as he said, the telephone rang in the yeah. telephone booth. Okay. The caller instructs the pilot to look under the shelf of the phone booth. There he will find further instructions. He read that note aloud as he stood there outside the phone booth. That allowed us to hear and to know what that letter contained, and we uh, immediately dispatch ground units in the direction that he was told to fly. The pilot is instructed to fly west along Highway 50 at an altitude of 500 feet. At some point, he will see a strobe light where he is to land. Not much altitude in the mountains like that. Very, very low, very, very hazardous for a helicopter to be that low at midnight we were going to do the best we could to provide ground coverage for the protection of our pilot and also obviously to arrest, to apprehend this perpetrator if that was at all possible. So immediately we had cars traveling westbound on Highway 50 for the sole purpose of either one uh, encountering the subject or the suspect in this case, or two, ensuring the safety of our pilot. A SWAT team flying a thousand feet above the FBI helicopter will provide added security. The thing that always makes you more apprehensive is the unknown. We didn't know who you were dealing with. We didn't know if we had 10 people, one person, two dozen, that were going to meet that airplane. The FBI pilot flies west, following Route 50. He maintains an altitude of exactly 500 feet as he searches for the strobe light. There is nothing but darkness below. It seems the bomber is playing some sort of deadly game, and the FBI is at his mercy. State Line, Nevada, 1980. An FBI helicopter searches a 15-mile stretch of Highway 50 for a signal from below. The extortionist who planted a massive bomb in a local casino has demanded $3 million. Agents know that appearing to comply is their best hope for arresting the bomb maker. The pilot flies through the mountains in the dark at an altitude of only 500 feet. He sees no signal from below. Assistant Special Agent in Charge Herb Hawkins controls the search operation from the ground. He came back, he flew it again. And he flew it again. We kept sending him back down the route. Please, we're looking, we're, we're, we can go. We got 
Then after he got through with his 15 miles, we put him at 250, 300 feet, which he was scared to death. This was an experienced Marine helicopter pilot who joined the FBI. And he's flying treetops, trying to comply with and make this successful. And he keeps calling me, Herb, I got nothing, I have nothing, everything's quiet, you know? And so I said, okay. Uh, then at four o'clock, we brought him back. It seems the bomber has won again. All the FBI's attempts to establish contact with him have failed. If he doesn't want the money, what does he want? Agents turn to their only other lead, the airport telephone booth where the bomber left instructions for the pilot. Special Agent Bill Junkie. We, of course, examined that telephone booth for latent fingerprints, and we interviewed a few people, but we basically came up with nothing. Nobody had seen anything at that airport that was suspicious in nature. So that was a dead end. We had not established contact with the extortionist. And that was of grave concern to us because we needed more communication. The next morning, the FBI asks Governor Robert List of Nevada to hold a press conference. He needs to convince the bomber to reestablish contact. This request is made due to a failure of enlightenment and a confusion in following the previous directions. The hotel is prepared to comply and is standing by as before. We had basically uh, silence on Wednesday. I think that the people were too cautious to make another contact. For the Tahoe Douglas bomb squad, it's a potentially deadly dilemma. How can they move the bomb without knowing what's inside? It was very heavy. It was made of steel, and it was loaded with up to a 1,000 pounds of explosive. We couldn't just pick it up and carry it out of it. We realized to, to even move it, even if we had a safe way to move, would require three to four people. That's way too many to have anywhere near a device that could explode. Even if they can move the device to the parking lot, then what? We, in essence, have a giant hand grenade here. If it exploded, it would send steel shrapnel all over the place. We really couldn't afford to have it outside. Agents and bomb experts do not know if the massive bomb is set on a timer, if the extortionist can set the bomb off remotely, or exactly how volatile the explosive material inside is. They have some hard decisions to make. One member of the team makes a radical suggestion. Our experts told us, and we all agreed, that if we could explosively separate this top box, knock it off the bottom box, at a very, very fast speed with explosives, we could defeat the electrical current from the battery that was being generated and maybe avoid a detonation of the main charge. The plan is to use six pounds of plastic explosives to destroy the top box. In essence, the bomb's brain. If they could sever that pulse from actually going down to the dynamite, it, it, it would may not go off. Everything depends on whether or not the top box is also rigged with explosives. If the top box contained dynamite, then our, our explosive separation would fail because in essence, the bomb would what we call sympathetically detonate, in other words, the explosion from our attempt to remove the top box would detonate all the explosives in the bomb. It's a risky procedure. The entire casino could be destroyed. They need permission from hotel owner Harvey Gross. And what he did say was, as long as nobody gets hurt, we can't keep doing what we're doing. We're going on for hours and hours and hours, and nobody can come up with a solution other than that, then that's OK. There was tears in his eyes, and he basically was giving us a directive that you take care of everyone here. Make sure nobody's harmed. I don't want anybody hurt. If the, the device does go off and it destroys a casino, we can rebuild it. The bomb squad sets up a linear-shaped charge, positioning the explosives to destroy the top box. Wires were run from the explosive charge to a window outside and eventually to a firing point out in the parking lot. There is no way to know whether the shaped charge will successfully disable the bomb or detonate it. 
we hoped that we would separate that top box and that there were, in fact, no explosives in there and we'd have no detonation. But we were fully prepared, and I have to say we expected detonation of up to 1,000 pounds of TNT, as the letter had indicated. So we were prepared for that when we fired that shape charge. At 3.55 p.m., Sheriff Jerry Maple broadcasts a warning. The disarming attempt is about to begin. Can we have the all clear? Everybody stand by. Five, five, four, four, three, three, two, two, one, one. In a casino in Nevada, FBI agents face the biggest bomb they've ever seen device packed with a 1,000 pounds of explosives. Their only option, blow the control box off the top of the bomb with a small explosive charge. Call you to stand by for countdown, please. Special Agent Bill Jonke watches from the roof of a nearby casino. We had high-speed cameras uh, prepared for the detonation. We were watching. We were keeping our fingers crossed. We, of course, could hear over the radio the, literally, the countdown. One. The plan has failed. Part of the casino has been reduced to rubble. Assistant Special Agent in Charge, Herb Hawkins. We had a major mess on our hands. We had a hotel that had been blown downward two stories, blown upward two stories. Numerous uh, pieces of device, rebar, concrete, chips, uh, wall, desks, furniture, all mashed up and, and in some of it in the hotel, down in the hole, uh, some of it up on the second and third floor and a bunch of it out in the parking lot. All of us probably had the same thought. We were thankful that we had not a single person with as much as a scratch. Nobody was hurt. We felt relief that the bomb in essence was gone. There was not a danger from that bomb anymore. Having to go back up on it for a day or two was getting stressful for everybody. So we felt a relief when that thing went off. If you destroy or damage a building, that can be rebuilt. We've had loss of human life or casualties is something that can never be healed. Myself and a few of the bomb technicians went into that building right away, right after detonation. However, it was pretty dangerous. Rubble is everywhere and the FBI is concerned the rest of the building might collapse. Once it is secured, agents go back into the casino to search for clues. We commenced a very thorough crime scene investigation, as you would have to do in a bombing case, as your crime scene is really the key to helping you solve the puzzle. But in this devastation, finding those clues will not be easy. When a bomb goes off, the components just don't evaporate. They become much smaller and obviously disfigured, but they're there. They're there in the rubble. They're there in the crater at the bottom. They're there. Our job is to find them and identify them as components of the bomb. Authorities estimate it could take nearly six weeks to process the crime scene. The FBI can't afford to give the bomber that much time to cover his tracks. Within days of the explosion, the state line casinos offer a $250,000 reward for the arrest and conviction of the extortionists. We hit every news media outlet with that information in hopes of somebody calling. We uh, generated and started a hotline, a 1-800 hotline, so that anybody in the country could call us toll free and provide information for this reward. The offer of a large reward brings thousands of leads, but no solid information. 
Several days went by, I'd say seven, eight, nine, ten days, and we, we got leads from this offer, but we didn't get what we considered to be viable leads from this, the group that was responsible for building and placing this bomb was probably very close-knit, maybe even a family, because we weren't getting any information. Agents hope that in the rubble they will find one piece of evidence that will lead them to the bomber. At the end of the 40 days, we'd recovered approximately 108 pounds of a bomb that we felt probably weighed around 800 pounds. So we recovered about an eighth of it. The items that we recovered primarily were heavy steel items that survived the blast. As each piece of the bomb is recovered, it is shipped to the FBI laboratory in Washington, D.C. This is the first opportunity the agents have to really study the bomb. We were able to determine the type of switches that were used, the mercury switches, uh, the type of explosive, pieces of cardboard box, things that would point where and how the device was constructed. Laboratory analysis tells agents a lot about the bomb and something about the bomber. One of the early things that we did was have the metallurgist look at the bomb components we were recovering and determine the stresses on those pieces of metal from a metallurgical point of view to tell us what forces were exerted against them in the blast. And by doing that, we could put a family of explosives into this. And while the threat letter said it was TNT, we're not about to take that on face value. We want to know that the damage was consistent with an explosive like TNT, which it was not. So we, right away we know something about the bomber. He didn't tell the truth in the letter. He was trying to tell us something that would get your attention. The bomber used dynamite instead of TNT. Because TNT is more powerful, he yeah. probably mentioned it to intimidate investigators. It was a very complex scheme, and therefore, when you looked at the device, a complex mind had to have put this together. A very painstaking, patient individual. This was not built in a day. This was a device that looked like it had taken weeks, if not months, to build. And to build it without drawing attention probably required even more time. To try and learn more about the bomber, agents asked for assistance from FBI profilers at the Behavioral Science Unit, then housed at the FBI complex at Quantico. Profilers determined the bomber is probably a male, in his late 30s or early 40s, with some sort of bomb-making experience. Based on the complexity of the device and the letter, they feel the bomber is egocentric. He believes he can outsmart investigators. Hawkins? And the bombing profile is extremely difficult. It's not like a murder where the guy leaves certain fingerprints at the scene. Bombing is a lot more complex. Personal, when you shoot somebody, it's more impersonal when you build a bomb and you put it under his car and turn around and walk away. You don't have to sit there and watch. He doesn't like to get close to his victims. The agents also suspect something other than money motivates this bomber. Is this a terrorist act? And what's the goal of this particular act? Is it to just make money? Are these people uh, involved with narcotics and drugs? Do we have organized crime, the mafia? We did not believe that organized crime would try and pull this type of thing. We didn't think the druggers would try and pull this type of thing. They like to remain off the skyline. Investigators are running out of leads and the bombers seem poised to strike again. In Reno, 40 miles north, four more casinos receive bomb threats. In Stateline, Nevada, the FBI searches for a dangerous extortionist. He's already blown up one casino, and in his extortion note, he threatened to do it again. The FBI fears the bomber is simply toying with them. In Reno, 40 miles north, four more casinos receive bomb threats. Investigators search the casinos, but no bombs are found. 
Further investigation reveals these threats aren't connected to the Harvey's bombing. Agents again appeal to the public for help. They distribute descriptions of the suspects based on the security guard's recollections. Assistant Special Agent in Charge, Herb Hawkins. We were bombarded with thousands upon thousands of phone calls. In early September, agents receive an intriguing tip. Three former employees of a jet aircraft plant moved to Reno just before the casino bombing. According to the FBI lab in Washington, some of the electronic components used in the bomb resemble aircraft parts. Aircraft engineers could have the technical savvy to put together a device like this. Special Agent Bill Junkie. They fit our profile, if you will, of being a group. They had access, they had experience in explosive work. They looked pretty darn good. And we spent a lot of investigative man hours looking into these people and covering the leads from this group that extended nationwide. We focused on this group with a lot of our resources for two to three weeks before we were finally able to eliminate them as suspects. It's one of many dead ends, and the bomber has gone strangely silent. Desperate for leads, investigators review every phone tip they have received since the bombing. Assistant Special Agent in Charge Herb Hawkins wades through thousands of memos. On October 1st, a small tip catches his eye. A motel owner saw a white van leaving her motel in South Lake Tahoe an hour before the bomb was delivered. From witness statements, the FBI knows that the bomb was delivered in a white van. Hawkins thinks it's too close to be a coincidence. When I picked that memo up, first it came in on the 800 line and no one looked at it. It's now a month old. And a suspicious vehicle leaving at 4.30 in the morning in a van needs to be covered. Agents interview the motel owner who called in the tip. On August 26th at 4 a.m., she heard strange noises in the parking lot of the motel. She awoke and went to a window and saw two to three individuals in white overalls trying to start a white van. She copied down the license number to ensure that it was the same license number on the registration card. The next day, she called the FBI hotline. Agents learn the name on the hotel registration card is fake. They run the license plate number of the white van through the California Department of Motor Vehicles. The information that came back from the DMV check on that license plate was that the vehicle was registered to a Mr. John Burgess, who was a resident of Clovis, California, which is right down by Fresno. Immediately, agents in the Fresno office went to pay a visit to Mr. Burgess and see why that van of his was up at Lake Tahoe and was being occupied by three people who appeared to be suspicious. Burgess tells agents he doesn't know what they're talking about. He owns a white van, but his son usually drives it. We were unable to gather very much information from Mr. Burgess other than the fact that his son had the vehicle and that his son might be involved in growing marijuana. Agents interview Burgess's son in Fresno. They ask him what he was doing in Tahoe at 4 o'clock in the morning and why he used a fake name on his registration. The young man told the investigators that he was up at Lake Tahoe looking for a place to grow marijuana. These agents realized that Lake Tahoe was at an elevation of 6,200 feet plus. It is not conducive whatsoever to growing marijuana because of the climatic conditions. So that was a pretty lame excuse. Agents suspect Burgess's son is lying, but they don't know why. They don't think he's the bomber. At 18, they feel he's too young to construct a bomb this complex. Agents move on, searching for more viable leads. 
The investigation into this bombing wore on and on and on. We interviewed well over 400 people, suspects in this bombing throughout the country. The bomb caused $3 million in damage. The people behind this must be stopped before they build another bomb. But agents are running out of leads. They have not heard from the bomber in months. By November, all but 16 agents are called home. The investigation is stalling. The FBI tries a new approach. In the early part of 1981, we decided that we needed to up the ante for the reward. The reward was then increased to $500,000, from $250,000 to $500,000. If a tight-knit group is responsible for the casino bombing, the FBI is betting that a half a million dollars in cash should be enough money to tear it apart. We got our $500,000, and we got the news media, uh, asked them to put this out. We had a small news conference, and uh, it was. It was prolific. The FBI's gamble pays off. And it wasn't but a very short time, maybe a few days, that our phone call came in. A young man called the Fresno office of the FBI and told them that we had been close, but we weren't on the right guy. He told us that it was not the young son of Mr. Burgess that we should be looking at, that it was in fact John Burgess Sr. himself who was responsible for this. The tip makes sense. Although John Burgess didn't appear to be a likely suspect, agents have never resolved why his son was in the Tahoe area when the bomb was delivered. Within days, the entire investigation is moved from State Line, Nevada, to Fresno, California. There was an already a resident agency there, but we established another office there, and we brought in another 30, 40 agents to Fresno to begin our focus on John Burgess. I personally believe that this was our guy. It was a family situation involved. He had two sons who could have helped him and would not have uh, participated in the reward. They would have kept their mouths shut like we expected. And I moved down to Fresno with great anticipation. I thought, this is it. The FBI suspects John Burgess Sr. is the casino bomber but they still need evidence linking him to the crime before they can make an arrest. A major casino lies in ruins, decimated by a massive bomb. The FBI suspects that John Burgess, a Fresno landscaping contractor, is the mastermind behind the devastating bomb. Special Agent Bill Jonke. Our investigation of John Burgess Sr included everything we can think of. We talked and interviewed to uh, interviewed his relatives, his friends. We surveilled him day and night. We checked his background. We checked people who had worked for him. Burgess has an interesting past, according to Special Agent Herb Hawkins. He was a Hungarian immigrant who had run afoul of the Soviets during the Hungarian Revolution. He went to a slave labor camp exiled by the Soviets to that area and had a great amount of work with explosives. Through interviews, agents learn that Burgess is in financial trouble. In March 1980, the IRS filed suit against him for $34,000 in back taxes. He also owes Harvey's Casino $15,000 in unpaid gambling markers. His gaming losses that he told us about and that we had verified through records beforehand only led to make him a stronger suspect because we always felt that whoever did this had a grudge against Harvey's casino, probably owed him money or had lost money, so it, it really fit perfectly into our bomber profile. Agents feel John Burgess has the skill and the motive to bomb Harvey's casino. Now they need to prove it. Myself and another agent were assigned to contact Mr. Burgess every single day, seven days a week. Just pay a visit to him and talk to him, get him to talk. Some days he'd 
yell and scream at us and wouldn't let us in. Other days he'd let us in and talk to us. Burgess is very egotistical. He likes to talk about his successful landscaping business and his skill in electronics. The profilers were correct. Things started to fall into place in terms of background. Now we needed to find out there in Fresno, did he build a device there and where did he buy the stuff to do this? You have a bombing, one of the first things you do is you start looking around for thefts. Where did this, could, where could this stuff have come from? They could make it themselves, they could import it, they could steal it, they could buy it. You start, go to the ATF and pull all the theft reports. Agents learned that 1,000 pounds of dynamite was stolen from a construction site near Burgess's home prior to the casino bombing. So the, the puzzle started to come together and um, it was time that we got people to start talking to us from inside the family. Agents interview a member of Burgess's extended family who owns a large turkey farm near Fresno. They're particularly interested in the switches on a feeding mechanism Burgess constructed for the farm. It was identical to the construction of the bomb. It was the same type of plastic material that he used, the same kind of soldering that he used. Agents turn up the pressure on Burgess's sons and finally persuade them to talk. Both kids in general told us the same story, that, that initially their father had asked them to participate in this extortion attempt. Both kids were not anxious to do it. They didn't want to do it, but they had loyalty to their father. And they, at times, provided some labor. Burgess's son admits he did not grow marijuana. He made up the story to protect his father. The FBI learns that two employees in Burgess's landscaping business were the men who delivered the bomb to Harvey's casino. Burgess's sons say their father's girlfriend helped write the extortion letter. And they lead authorities to the place where their father hid the remainder of the stolen dynamite. They also provided us with uh, information about an additional explosives theft that occurred at basically the same site. And they told us where this explosive was buried. 600 pounds worth of dynamite was buried in a dry creek bed outside of Fresno. Mr. Burgess had told the boys he planned to build another bomb and put it somewhere else. August 16, 1981, John Burgess is arrested as he tries to leave his home. Burgess and his co-conspirators are charged with commercial extortion and conspiracy. Burgess's sons plead guilty to conspiracy and are sentenced to probation. On April 15, 1985, John Burgess is convicted and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. The FBI lost a building, but the operation was a success. No one lost their lives, and the FBI captured the bomber before he could strike again. So we learned a lot about processing large building bombing. What you have to do first, second, and third, where the pitfalls are, where the dangers are. Now, unfortunately, since then, all around the globe, we've had opportunities to practice the lessons and refine the lessons that we learned there.